Okay, so let's get started. Uh, today I'm going to cover atomic absorption, chromatography, not chromatography, spect spectroscopy. Um, but I'll start with some recap uh, questions from our lecture last time to get you all back into the zone of spectroscopy. Um, what are the different species of matter that can be analyzed using spectroscopy? When you say species of matter, what do we mean? Very simple. We're either analyzing. Yes, thank you. Atoms and molecules. Okay, so either molecules or atoms. And today the focus is in atomic absorption spectroscopy or atomic emission spectroscopy, which is based on measuring atoms. Okay. Uh, name the different forms of radiation matter interactions. We have so many different forms of radiation matter interactions. So what what are they? Yes, Dan. Yes. So Dan said absorption, emission, light scattering, refraction or diffraction. I didn't hear properly, but refraction, diffraction, reflection, interference. Um, these are all interactions uh, between matter and radiation. So, what are the spectral regions most relevant to food analysis? Yes, Holland. Yes, UV, uh, Holland says UV, visible, and infrared. These are the three most relevant in food analysis. Very good. Um, Name spectroscopy spectrometry analytical techniques. We have so many of them. Today we're going to cover one. So, Chris, what's that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Chrissy, atomic absorption is one. So, we do have absorption uh, spectroscopy. I don't know why chromatography is stuck on my head. We have absorption uh, spectroscopy. It could be molecular or it could be atomic absorption. We have emission that is related to fluorescence absorption. Um, we have IR, uh, infrared, um, for identification purposes and detection. Yeah, where, what are some applications? So I said identification, detection. What else? We identify, we detect. What do we do as well, Chrissy? We quantify. So we do qualitative analysis, we do quantitative analysis for quantitation for composition analysis or any other type of quantification for not necessarily for composition for any other components of interest. So we can do um, detection of adulteration, we can do um, kind of food forensic type of work with spectroscopy. So many applications and they will come along when we cover other chapters along the way for the rest of the semester. So we talked about different forms of energy. We talked about electronic energy, vibrational energy, rotational energy. So what's the difference between electronic energy versus vibrational energy? I know some of you or most of you have a fermentation test today, so you're all worried about that and probably studying. But let me just quickly um, tell you the difference just because Okay, so somebody said vibration is bond, bond energy, yes. So electronic energy is when an electron in the valence shell gets excited or in a bond uh, shared between two atoms, get excited to the next level or the next um, shell. So it goes from its original state in its valence shell, valence electron, and then it goes to an excited state, to a higher level. And then it doesn't stay there. It goes down to ground level after exciting, being excited with the electronic energy. Vibrational energy, it's of a smaller energy than electronic energy. And it is equivalent, the energy is equivalent to the spectrum 
of IR radiation. And IR has longer wavelength than UV, invisible light. So it carries less energy. So these energy um, um, spectrum or these energy district distinct um, for size, the size of these energy are, um, the size of this energy is smaller than the energy of the electronic type. So it's vibration of the bond, so bending and stretching of the bond. Um, what's the difference between absorption and fluorescence? And you want to think about photon of light. So if you have a photon of light, so in this case, you don't think about the wave properties of light, you think about the particulate property of light, which is the photon. So for absorption, what's happening? The molecule or the atom is doing what? Okay, so the molecule or the, oh, the, um, Sam. Yeah, so you're absorbing, the molecule or the atom is actually absorbing the same amount of energy that it hit it. So the photons of light that hit that um, molecule or atom, it is absorbing that same amount. And there's only this distinct um, amount of energy that could be absorbed. So every molecule and every atom has different allowable amounts of energy to be absorbed. That's why every atom or every molecule absorbed at a different wavelength, has a unique spectrum. Because if the energy is not within the allowable unit of energy levels that the molecule or atom has, it won't absorb it. So it has to be within its allowable um, energy. Fluorescence, on the other hand, is when the molecule or atom go back to the um, ground state by emitting a photon of light. All atoms or molecules will have to go back to the um, ground state. So they go back by either giving the energy as heat, so dissipation of heat, or some of them fluoresce. So they give a little bit of energy as heat and the rest of energy is um, as light. So because it's lower energy than the absorbed energy, it has a longer wavelength. So when we do a fluorescence measurement, we always have an absorption uh, wavelength, which is of higher energy, lower wavelength, than our detection wavelength, where we are detecting the fluorescence at longer wavelength, which means at lower energy. Diffraction and refraction. So in diffraction of light, I'm not going to ask you any more questions because I know you're tired and you have an exam. So in just, I'm just reminding you, diffraction is when the light hits a diffracting or a grating system where the light fragments into multiple wavelengths. So instead of just all of the wavelengths are hitting the grating system, it, that light is going to diffract into individual waves with individual wavelengths. So how does the wavelength impact the frequency and energy? We talked about that too. With shorter wavelengths, you have more oscillation in a unit time. So the frequency will be higher when you have shorter wavelengths. Um, so with shorter wavelengths, you have higher frequency, higher energy. Okay, so now I just refreshed your memory about these basic, basic things. I will just go ahead with atomic absorption. Okay. So some of you have already done the lab and you got a nice intro already to the atomic absorption. Um, so I'll just, today I'm just going to go through the theory with you. Um, some of you will be doing the lab next week as well. So I'll go through the theory and some of you have done the applied, some of you will do the applied next week. So in atomic spectroscopy, we can measure absorption or emission. So we can do either. For atomic 
absorption spectroscopy, we have two kinds. The flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, which some of you already did in the lab or were doing in the lab. And there's the electrothermal atomic absorption spectroscopy, which is less common, and I'll describe the difference between the two. In emission, uh, atomic emission spectroscopy, we have the regular flame emission spectroscopy or flame emission photometry. And the more advanced is the inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. It's a mouthful, but I will explain it today and talk about what does it mean when we say inductively coupled plasma. So uh, atomic emission spectroscopy. So why do we use atomic absorption as spectroscopy in general, atomic absorption or atomic emission? So the uses is both for elements, for measuring elements, either elements that are mineral nutrients, so like calcium, iron, which you did in the lab or you're gonna do in the lab, sodium, potassium, so mineral, mineral nutrients. And then we have the toxic heavy metal that we care about measuring to, so that we don't have the, to make sure that our food is safe in that regard. Okay, so everything in pink, potentially you can uh, utilize atomic absorption spectroscopy or atomic emission spectroscopy to measure. We care about essential nutrients that the, our body needs. These are plenty and they're in table 9.1 in your uh, textbook for your reference, but some of these are listed on the, on the nutrition label. So we care for calcium, we care for potassium, we care for sodium, and we care for iron. Specifically, these are the ones that are um, listed on the label but we definitely need the others in a certain amount as well. Toxic elements, so the heavy elements, lead, mercury, cadmium, nickel, and others. These, um, uh, arsenic is another one. So some are okay at a particular level. Some, they all have different levels for which they would be considered toxic. So the USDA nutrient base, if we want to look up any food and look up uh, mineral elements in these foods, we, we, we have a, quite a bit of a database for a lot of different elements, but not for all of them. But we do have enough to go back and see for different foods, what are the different, how much do we have of those different elements or essential nutrients. So to dive into the principle a little bit more, which you already, we already covered. So in absorption, we are talking about, when we say atomic absorption or atomic emission, we're talking about the uh, absorption at the neutral atomic state. So your elements, minerals, usually are in a molecule, like sodium chloride, calcium phosphate. So they are in a molecule type. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, in a free atom state. And they're also sometimes carrying charge. So sodium, if it's solubilized, sodium chloride, you have an A plus and Cl minus. So in, to measure the absorption or emission of these elements, they have to be in a neutral atomic state. in the gaseous state too. So they should be in the gaseous state, atomic. That means you don't have molecular bonds. The molecular bonds are broken and they're not in the ion form. They don't carry charge. So it's, it's a beautiful technique because every element has different spectra in which they absorb light. So for example, you have two elements. So A and B, they absorb light and they have a different um, maxima and different shape of at which wavelength they absorb. So different selectivity. And also they fluoresce at different um, wavelengths. So if we're measuring emission, we can see that A is uh, the maximum absorption or emission of A is a different wavelength as the maximum absorption or sorry, emission 
for B. So we utilize this difference to differentiate between elements and to be able to measure them. So I just want to remind you again with, uh, with atomic absorption or emission, the element needs to absorb light and that light or energy of that light needs to be within the allowable energy levels. But as a reminder, so they go from ground state when they absorb the energy to excited state, but that's electronic energy. So atoms do not vibrate so, and they don't rotate. There's no center of gravity for them in it with like the rotation energy for molecules. So basically you don't see these levels. You don't, you don't have rotational levels or vibrational level when you're measuring atoms. You only have electronic levels. So minerals, when we're measuring them in the atom gaseous state, they only have electronic energy levels. Just remember that. Okay, so some of you already done that and learned about it in lab, some of you have not yet. So what you normally have is a liquid sample. So your minerals should be soluble in a solution. So in order to do that, whatever the food product is, we'll talk about sample preparation later, but then you have to get the minerals out of that sample and solubilize it in a liquid solution. So in order to do that, we often ash the sample. That means you take your sample, you incinerate it at high temperature, so your organic compounds burn out or oxidize. Sometimes we do uh, the ashing with a little bit help of a nitric acid, which is uh, also used to oxidize the organic matter. So we combine wet ashing a little bit with dry ashing to get rid of my organic matter and what remains are only your uh, minerals, hopefully. These minerals are your ash. So these minerals and in the ash form need to be solubilized. And often you solubilize them in, in an acidic solution. And now you have a solution with your minerals in there. But the minerals are in a molecular form. The first thing you need to do, you have a nebulizer in your atomic absorption unit. The nebulizer is going to take your moisture, so it's going to, they get aspirated. So you have a little tube that you put in your bottle or you have your solution. And that little tube is going to suck up the liquid, take it into a nebulizer and the nebulizer is going to convert it into a mist. So it will break down that liquid into very small particles. And this mist is going to um, be directed to a flame or a plasma. In lab, we turn on a flame using um, acetylene as a source for fuel and air as a source of oxygen to get that flame. And then when you have that flame and your, your high mist is reaching the flame, the high the heat from the, in that flame is going to break the molecular bonds. So first you have evaporation of your solvent and then your, um, your molecule bonds are going to be broken and, and you have your uh, atoms now. You have your elements in an atom form that is in the gaseous state. So we start with solution, desolidation, you have your molecule, it gets vaporized and atomized, you have your atom. Now that atom potentially can ionize. So this has to be, uh, this is related to the flame temperature. And that's very important. Some of you might have seen this with Cindy in the lab where you regulate the incoming amount of air and acetylene, where you have this balanced combination to give you a flame temperature that would be sufficient to break the bonds, yet not to cause ion formation. At a higher flame um, temperature, 
your atoms may ionize. And when they ionize, they absorb at a different spectra. They have different spectra. So you might get underestimation of your mineral content. So if the flame is at not the right temperature, if let's say it's too cold, for example, relatively cold, and not, uh, not necessarily hot enough to break the molecules, you might have molecules not broken that might scatter your light. Then less light will, will reach the detector and the detector will give you higher absorption because then the detector will assume that less light is coming to it. That means more was absorbed by the sample. But it's false because the sample, the flame was not hot enough. Your molecule did not break. It was there in the flame and when the light is coming, it's getting scattered by the molecules and less light is reaching the detector. So when you think about way, reasons for overestimation or underestimation, the flame is very, has a very important role. Are we getting the molecules broken down into atoms? Is the heat enough? If it's not, I'm going to get overestimation. If the heat is high, if the flame's temperature is higher than need be, I'm going to get ionization. And these ions will not absorb at the same light uh, spectra. Then I'll get underestimation. So these examples, when you answer your lab report question, you can think about it. It's not necessarily happened to your sample, but things to think about in case of overestimation and or underestimation. That's one possible so something else you need to learn about, about atomic absorption is the, um, the source of light. Because we need the elements to absorb light. So we need to give them the source of light that allows absorption within their allowed spectra. Okay, so the most common source of light we have for atomic absorption is the halo cathode lamp. So the halo cathode lamp, from its name, it's hollow. So it, it has an um, um, inner gas in it. It could be iron gas or neon. And you have an anode and you have a cathode. So the anode is made of tungsten. And the cathode is made, this, this is important, the cathode is made up of the metal form of the element of interest. So if we're measuring iron, it would be made up of the metallic form of iron. If we're measuring calcium, the same thing. So that's why you would change lamps when you're measuring different elements, because you need that cathode that is specific for that element to give you the spectra within the absorption uh, allowable energy for that element. For those of you that did the lab already, you learned about changing the lamps. Next week, the rest of you will learn that, that between measuring calcium and measuring iron, you have to use a different lamp because each lamp will have a different cathode. Some lamps can come with multiple cathodes, two cathodes or, or more then you can measure a couple of elements at the same time without having to change the lamp. A less common source of light is the electrode-less discharge lamp. So again, it's a hollow tube uh, with an inner uh, fuller gas plus the element of interest. The discharge, however, is produced by radio frequency and the, gen the radio frequency generator coil. It can be used for multiple, for more volatile elements, but it is a less common form of uh, light source. I don't have a picture of our most current atomic absorption unit, but over the years we had three of them. I think these are the two older versions. Uh, the first one was very shabby, the next one was a little better, and the one we have now is better. But all of them have the same or similar components. You have 
the net, uh, the little tube that you would um, insert in your tube where you have your sample and it would aspirate your sample and you have your nebulizer and then here you have a bigger tube where excess liquid can come out and goes to the waste. Um, here is where your flame you normally would ignite um, and then you can regulate the amount of uh, acetylene and air that allow that gives you the flame the characteristic flame and it's beautiful to watch the flame and when your sample is aspirated and the flame color changes and the way it changes is specific for the type of element uh, that you are uh, measuring So here's just another illustration of what happens. So you have your uh, um, sample holder where you have your solution, that little tube that would aspirate your solution, your liquid into the nebulizer and the nebulizer will make your liquid into mist. And you have, you generate the flame. So basically this is kind of like your sample crucible or sample holder, the flame is. And you have your lamp source with the appropriate cathode. You have the, um, the light coming in, molecules broken in the flame into atoms. Atoms are going to um, absorb part of the light at a specific wavelength that you select. For example, for um, iron, I believe it's like 248 point something, and then the calcium 422. So one in the visible range and one is not. Um, so these specific elements or compounds will absorb the light. And then you have the transmitted light that gets into the detector and your photons of light converted to electrical signal and then you get an absorption measurement. You have, we will have to uh, um, follow Beer's law and we'll talk about Beer's law on Monday. So the is simply the relationship between absorption and concentration taking into account the length where um, the area, or not area, the length of your crucible or your sample holder. So we'll talk more about that uh, next week. This is another visual to actually show you literally what could happen. So Again, you have your uh, light, the flame with the sample in it coming in through here. And the, the light that is given by the lamp is in the exact spectrum for your element of interest. Then the element absorbs light and the, the remaining light will be transmitted inside your uh, compartment where you have your detector. Before the light gets to the detector, it hits a grating agent. That's your uh, monochromator. So you have a monochromator here. This is called the monochromator. So with that, because you have light coming from the lamp, not specific to that wavelength you're measuring at, and you also have light coming from the flame itself. So this way, the monochromator is going to kind of filter out the wavelength that you're not wanting to measure at and sing, give you a singular wavelength that you have chosen, which is the lambda max for your element. So your element will absorb light at different wavelengths, but you select the one that has the maximum absorption, which is illustrated here. You, you choose that wavelength. So you choose that wavelength, so meaning the monochromator is going to diffract the light into multiple wavelengths. And the one wavelength will be selected. And that's the one that you select as lambda max, 248, 422, depending what you're measuring, 248 for iron, 422 for calcium. So you select it. And then it goes to your detector. So the detector, the most common detector used in flame atomic absorption is called photomultiplier detector. 
TMT, photomultiplier detector, or photomultiple tube detector. That's better. Photomultiple tube detector. That's the actual um, abbreviation. Okay, so what do you have in that? Why is it called multiple multiplier? Because what happens is your light that comes out from your monochromator and goes into the detector, it's going to hit the cathode and an electron is going to be emitted. And the electron hits a dynode and more electrons will be emitted. And there will be multiple dynodes in there that every time it hits, it multiplies. So you end up multiplying the signal. So you have you enhance the sensitivity of the detection. So you can detect at much lower concentrations. So that is the, the photomultiplier tube detector. That's what it does. It multiplies the signal. So you enhance the detection. Okay. If you have questions, do ask. Okay. Pam, I have a question. Yes. Um, the monochromator, is that a mechanical piece where you can set the lambda max for whatever you want? Yes, it is. It is a mechanical piece. Chris is asking if the monochromator is a mechanical piece where you set the light. So, so you have a slit here. Um, obviously, this is a very simple illustration of it. I'm trying to get my mouth. So you have this in here, you have the grater, and the grater is going to break the light into multiple wavelengths. This is just a very simple illustration of what happens, but actually you have multiple wavelengths that would be coming off of the grater. And here you have a slit that the, it mechanically can be uh, moved based on programming to select the wavelength to, that you want to detect at. So you can select using your atomic absorption spectrometer or spectrometer, you can select multiple wavelengths. So that monochromator can select multiple wavelengths. And then the, the, um, the lamp, when you change it, you give different spectra each time. And the monochromator acts as a mechanical unit based on programming that would select that wavelength that you want to measure. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. This is the less common form of atomic absorption. And this is, instead of having a flame, you have a graphite. So in here, so you have, it's called electrothermal uh, atomic absorption because you have a graphite furnace. So in here, you have a tube and you have a platform and that platform can get heated. So you would heat that platform to really high temperatures, 2000 to 3000 degrees Celsius, if you can imagine. That's very, very hot. So you would put your sample on this platform you, because it is uh, not a continuous aspiration, you can, you can have smaller samples. For example, with atomic absorption, you need to have enough quantity, 10 milliliter or 50 milliliters or whatever, depending on how long it stays in that, the tube inside. Otherwise, if you're doing several element measurements, you will, might run out of sample. So with here, if you have just limited amount of sample to work with, you can do that with the graphite uh, system, furnace system. You can put whatever you have there. So you have lower threshold, higher sensitivity. However, you have lower sample throughput. It's not as easy because this is really hot. So you can't really, when it's hot, open it and put multiple samples in there. So it is just takes longer time and it is yeah you can with the atomic flame atomic absorption you can run a sample and then change it put another the tube in, and wash the tube and then put it in another sample and you have you can measure more samples in a shorter period of time that's what it means when you say lower sample throughput 
uh, yeah, with other uh, like lower precision sometimes and matrix interferences as well are common disadvantages with this type of furnace, atomic absorption. So that's atomic absorption in terms of theory and uh, units. The flame emission uh, spectroscopy is also used. Um, ICP is newer form of flame emission spectroscopy. The older form is you use the flame itself. So you generate the flame and you use the flame to not only atomize, but to also excite the atoms. So there is no source of light here. So you don't have um, a lamp in this case. So that's what it says here. The heat is used for both atomization and excitation. So you have, instead of having a lamp for excitation and the flame for atomization, here you have the flame, you use the flame for both, to atomize and to excite. But then the, the limited amount of elements can be measured this way. Only the elements that have low excitation energy, like sodium and potassium, are very common elements that are analyzed by flame emission spectroscopy. So the thing is that flame emissions, you can either have flame emission spectroscopy where you have a monochromator unit, the mechanical unit that you would fill, select the light by grating system, or you have the flame photometry, which is also common. In this case, you don't have a monochromator, you have filters that filters out the light into the, and select the one um, light of interest or wavelength of interest. So in here, we have absorption of light, but we are measuring emission. Okay, so we want to measure, we want to make sure that we have the correct uh, energy to absorb it, but the, fo the, the elements are emitting photons of light that we are measuring in this case. And that's the difference between the absorption and the emission. We're measuring the emitted photons. We'll get to those next time. All right. So the ICP, well, it's the inductively coupled plasma. Uh, here we're using plasma. Plasma is the um, fourth state of matter. That means you have, you have your solid, liquid, gas, plasma. Gas, the plasma is ionized gas, basically. So what happens here is the plasma is generated by, by a gas, and usually it's aragon gas that we use. And it has, it generates a high concentration of cations and electrons. And the temperature is really, really high, 5,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. You get very effect, effective atomization. So the plasma is the source of atomization and the source of excitation in ICP. And then you have radio frequency power applied to copper oil. That is the inductively, that's why it's called inductively coupled plasma. Because you have the radio frequency power applied to the copper oil, generates that high energy, high heat. So the arrogant gas uh, oxidize, well not oxidize, ionizes, and then you have your plasma at very high temperature. You get here atomization, effective atomization, and you get effective excitation. Even though the temperatures are high, you don't have a risk of ionization, which we have with the flame atomic absorption. The reason we don't have uh, this problem with ionization with the plasma at this high temperature is the actual presence already of high concentrations of cations and electrons in the system. So that prevents ionization of your atoms. So 
So this is an illustration of the system. This is the actual sigma. So you have your um, arrogant gas and you apply the radio frequency to the copper coil that gets really heated and your arrogant gas ionized and you would have plasma with a high temperature of ionized species in there. You get your nebulizer also here. So you will have your sample, you pump it in, get nebulized or converted into mist, and then travels into the plasma. Here in the plasma, it gets atomized and it gets, it absorbs energy. The energy it absorbs, it emits part of it as it goes from excited state to, to ground state. So it emits the energy as light, photons of light, and they hit a mirror here, and then the grating system. The grating system is going to diffract the light into different wavelengths. So in this example, we have multiple photomultiplier tubes. You have one here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven detectors. So what you can do, you can potentially measure seven different elements simultaneously. So each of these wavelengths are, di are directed to different photomultiplier tubes. So in the uh, inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy unit, you can have a setup like this where you have multiple PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, and you can simultaneously detect multiple elements. Or you can have an even more advanced detector in this, for, in this technology. It's called the charge injector or injection detector. This detector allows you to uh, detect elements, multiple elements at the same time. So you, you don't have to have multiple photo uh, multiplier tubes detector. You will have one detector. Oh, I will show that later. You would have one, one detector where the light coming in is actually you have a prism and a diffraction grating system where all of the light is coming, all of the light at different wavelengths is hitting the detector at the same time. And the detector gives you a spectra and you can detect multiple elements at the same time. It's a very convenient but very expensive detector. This is just illustration of the plasma and the temperature along the plasma. So, Back to this, we can have either sequential or simultaneous. So cheaper models will have one PMT in it where you can program it to measure at specific wavelengths and then change to another and change to another. So you can measure sequentially. Same sample is going into your plasma. No, you don't have to worry about lamps or anything. The same sample going into the plasma and you're sequentially measuring at different wavelengths with one detector. Or you can have a more expensive unit where you have multiple PMT detectors and you can measure six, seven at the same time. Or you can get the ISHO spectrometer, which is the most expensive and the one that has the, um, the detector, which can, the, CCD detector or CID detector. So you don't have to worry about all these names. You just remember that this initial spectrophotometer allows detection of multiple elements at the same time, given that your light is divided into multiple wavelengths using grading system and a prism. Then you get a lot of elements analyzed at the same time. So that's what you want to remember. Don't worry about CID and CCD and all of that. Just remember issue detector, you have a prism, a grading system that 
diffracts the light and all of the light hits the detector and you get multiple, many elements detected at the same time. So that's the most efficient, but the most expensive type of uh, unit. So now that you know the difference between atomic absorption and atomic emission spectroscopy, I'll talk a little bit about sample prep. Um, so oftentimes, uh, depending on your av the availability in your lab, if you have a muffled furnace, you can do dry ashing. The muffled furnace basically is furnace where you can put your samples in crucibles and it heats up to really high temperatures, 450 to 500 or even higher. And that burns off your sample, your organic matter burns off and what's left is ash. You can do wet ashing, and this is often used for elements that are volatile. So take zinc and iron, they're volatile elements. So if you put them at really high combustion temperature, you might get underestimation of iron and zinc due to them being volatile. If you do wet ashing, you are using concentrated acid. And with that concentrated acid, you don't need to heat to that high temperature to combust your organic matter. So if you use nitric acid, for example, you would heat to 200 to 300 degrees Celsius and the acid and the heat together help combust your sample. So basically you uh, won't lose volatiles. If you have any underestimation of iron, it could be one reason could be volatilization during um, ashing. So that's another example of potential underestimation for um, volatile samples or volatile minerals. So we have the dry ashing, we have the wet ashing, or you can do direct injection. If you're measuring elements in water, if you're measuring elements in oil, you can do, you can do direct injection without having to ash your sample. <coughs> things that we have to be very careful about is the reagents we use to solubilize our ash and using blank, the standards we choose, and the lab glassware. So in lab, you will see or you have seen already that all glassware should be washed by acid, so acid washed glassware, so that you don't have any residual elements in your glassware. So they're all acid washed to solubilize any potential residue in your glassware that you use to prepare your samples. And you have crucibles. Crucibles has been also acid washed and ashed in the furnace before putting samples in them so that you don't have any contamination or overestimation due to contamination in your crucibles. So crucibles that you use, some of you have seen them already in the desiccator, some of you will see them next week. So there are small crucibles that you weigh in your sample, you put it in the muffled furnace, burns off your organic matter, sometimes you help with a little bit of acid. Then you take that ash and you add to it dilute acid to solubilize it. So sometimes it's concentrated acid and then you dilute it to get to a certain concentration. So the reagents that you use might have also elements contaminated with elements of interest. So the agent might cause overestimation. To counter that, you always run a blank. The blank is basically an anti-crucible and it goes through the entire process, the way you're doing your samples you treat your blank, but there's no sample in the crucible. So this corrects for any potential contamination in your um, sample coming from the agents. So blank is important. Standards, it's important to prepare your standards in the same way you prepare your sample, same reagents, same source of the reagent. And they should, <coughs> they should be highly pure elements no contamination, other type of element. Okay, I guess we can stop here and we'll continue next time with few remaining slides. All right, have a great weekend and good luck on your fermentation test.